So the words will be the same. I think I memorized them by now. Um, I think sometimes I drop a little bit of variation. So let's see how it goes. So hi, everyone. This, uh, now I forgot. <laughs> hi, everyone. So this event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have these amazing illustrations on the website, and this I just came up with. I usually don't say that, but the illustrations are amazing. Go check them out. Also, the website, it's very, very cool. And if you're interested in our events, there is a link in the description. So go there, click on this link, and you'll see all the events that we have in our schedule. Then there is this big button you have under the screen, under the video. Click on this, you get subscribed to our YouTube channel and get notified about all our events. And then finally, join our amazing Slack community and talk about all uh, possible data things. That's, that's really great. So I do suggest to click on this link. This is the most important link you have in the description. I will also have slides from Roman, which I'll put there. Um, so click on that as well. So and uh, during today's presentation, you can ask any question. So there's a pinned link in live chat. Go there, click on this, and ask your question. We will cover all these questions at the end. I think I that's it. So now, Roman, you can. The floor is yours. Uh, it's always scary. Okay. So uh, my name is Gravenikov Roman, and today we're going to talk about feature stores, open source feature stores, Apache Flink, and some philosophical. Uh, morning about the current state of feature stores. And just a short introduction about myself. I do machine learning for quite some time and for different areas from like quant trading, credit risk. And now I'm like for the last five years, I'm doing ranking and relevancy in an e-commerce area. And uh, I'm working for a company called Findify. And Findify itself is a search company so we do it's kind of a white label e-commerce uh, search like a buzzword bingo winner a uh, thing but it's actually if you go in a store you will see like personalized collections search results suggestions recommendations and it's just transparent and you won't even notice because it looks organic so we have quite some products in our index across maybe uh, 1,000 different stores in different countries and some traffic. We're not huge, so not Amazon definitely, but not uh, not so small. So we have, have still some problems of scale, but don't have resources of Amazon. <laughs> and the agenda of today's talk is mostly about uh, the road, the way to feature stores and how we came there. Will be just a short introduction about the problem we're trying to solve, like a machine learning problem. And the problem is uh, the different perspective on this machine learning problem from the, the perspective of having large data sets. Uh, we'll introduce the approach of feature store. So it's not like approach where introduce a product, buy, buy this product. Nope. It's mostly about the approach because uh, there are different solutions for that. Uh, the problems and the ideas we had about how can we uh, how can we embrace this approach and just some future thoughts about how, how it can be improved in the future and imagine that you came to a store online store to buy a pen or for example socks and uh, from the business perspective if you have too many socks on your store or too many pens it's quite important that uh, customer have limited like focus area so if your ranking uh, is not good and relevant product for this product is somewhere on the second page no one will just go there and probably just close the page and leave and you won't get your like uh, your purchase uh, but um, in the case of finify uh, we don't have enough of the like past historical data. Like Amazon has your purchase history for your whole life, but uh, Findify doesn't because for most of the medium and small stores, there are not so many returning customers. So you, you, the customer came and made some things on the website and will leave forever, probably. So for Findify, it's like 80% of the customers are non-returning. 
So it's not like a Findify problem, it's a problem of the medium and small stores because they're specialized usually, and you're not going to buy sofa every three months. Uh, but we still can do something about that. We don't have access to the past purchases because we just don't, but we can do uh, like intra-session re-ranking, intra-session personalization. So when a customer landed on the main page and did some search or brought some collections and interacted with products, at the moment of now, before the next search was made, we already know quite a lot of metadata about the customer. So we know that came from Google, from mobile, from this country, toggled like a gender male filter. So we might guess that it, this person might be interested in the, like male products. And the click was made on a something from the category socks and the color of the socks was red. So we already know a lot of metadata and we will be, if we'll be able to do something here, just to rank the products right here so we can like, improve the ranking dramatically and hopefully improving business metrics for our customers. Uh, but how can you define this problem from the machine learning perspective? So you have like a ranking and for each product, you can uh, like define a set of machine learning features like the click through rate on mobile for this product is 5%, that the title match query for this number of n-grams and customer also seen this color before, like he interacted with this color. The same for all the products. And uh, you, if you are just doing the inference, the machine learning part of like online machine learning part, you just dump these features into your model and get a ranking back. But if you want to do training, then you also have some historical data about how customer actually interacted with this ranking. So you have a click through, like, okay, we show this product one, two, three, and four, but customer interacted with number two and three and purchased the number three. So we can like unfold it into a more, try to find something like a data set. So we have four items in our original ranking. We know that the probably number three was the most relevant because it was purchased. Number two is kind of relevant because it was interacted with, but not purchased and others are not really. And you have all the features here, uh, like, like CTR and so on and so forth. But the problem with this feature is if you do a historical training, that uh, they should be uh, computed back in time. If you're using product price as, as a feature, it should be not like a product price from now, but product price from half a year and uh, taking it for offline training can be a bit complicated. So uh, as the price can be different in the past and can drift for different reasons, uh, there is like a quite a famous approach called feature logging. So while you do inference, you log all the features into some storage. And then if you need to do retraining, you just open, like load this feature from like a historical file and call it a day. But and for the case of prices, that seems to be fine until you don't need to have uh, like a, a glitch in your data. You need to recompute the feature back from the history, or you need to bootstrap a new feature. You implemented something like extra features on your for your model, but uh, you don't uh, have a way to pre-compute all this feature for all the history because kind of how can you do it easily? And uh, there is a feature store pattern for the design of uh, the way you work with features, with machine learning features. It's some sort of a dualism. So it, uh, it's the same system, but has two different ways to communicate with it. So there is an online part, which is more mostly about the inference. And you, we care about latency because we're just working with the real traffic. We need to compute these features quickly, quickly get the latest version of this feature to feed our model. And there is an offline part where we don't care about latency. It's just pure batch jobs, pure batch processing. And the only person who interferes and works with that is probably a data scientist doing some tasks like backfill bootstrap and and uh, model training. 
And uh, the feature store, as it uh, should be like dual for two different use cases, uh, can be implemented on top of. So if you go and check how other how existing feature stores uh, implemented down the hood for like for the way they store data, it's usually two different databases working with each other like synchronized so there is something for online like redis age base ndb big table whatever cassandra and offline it can be files on s3 BigQuery, hive just anything but for the batch processing because for online training you need only just the last well last last value and for offline training you don't really need the last value you need like a last value back in time so you need to do some sort of a point like time travel for the feature. So you need to have like all the change logs, how your feature changed back in time. And when you have this feature change log, you can like do a thing called point in time join. It's like a terminology for the most feature storages available right now in the market. And point in time join means that, okay, we have an event like someone clicked on the product number seven at that moment of time. And we have events describing how our price also changed in time for this product. So at the moment when this event happened, the price was like this. So it's just called point in time join, but it seems to be quite easy. Quite easy when you just need to join one product to one price. Uh, when you need to do some sort of a large scale training, you might get the situation when you need to join everything to everything and it quickly becomes quite a complicated. So for Findify, for example, like you have like 10 million searches per day with 24 products per search with 50 features per product, it can be quickly become quite cumbersome. We don't have enough data on our Amazon account. So we to, to perform this type of join uh, without any like algorithmical tricks and the we are not the first one having this problem in the industry so if we're talking about the feature store pattern the first like the most prominent talk or maybe paper about this approach was from uber uh, about michelangelo palette feature store their in internal uh, catalog or like a database for features for machine learning features which are not only just the features itself, but also like a pipeline on building these features. And these features uh, can be shared between different data science teams. So you don't need to reinvent a wheel and to compute click-through rate for 10th time in your company. You can just take it from the database of features, which will be not only just updated in real time with all the perks, but also we will get the access to all the historical information, how this feature changed so you can easily train your model on that with some extra perks like data drift, uh, cataloging, and, and so on. But the issue with the Michelangelo Palette feature store that it was never open sourced, but still inspired quite a lot of people in the industry, probably me also. And in 2021, there are actually at least three open source implementations of the ideas behind the Michelangelo Palette feature store. So Hopsworks, Feast, and Splice Machine. There are also the one from SageMaker feature store from Amazon, but it's not really open source, but who cares? Um, and uh, it's not only the single, like, not, not only the single uh, implementation of the feature stores. Once I asked Alexei about, like, okay, how do you store and catalog features on OLX? Like, do you use some sort of a feature store? And he was like, feature store, what? And I just made a short description about what's that. And they, oh, yeah, we do something like this. I never know that it's called feature store. So it's some sort of like an observation, like a low. So if your machine learning system is complicated enough and you have multiple data science team, probably you have like ad hoc informally specified feature store. You don't call it feature store, but still it's there. That's what happened also with Findify. And then we also found that it's called feature store. Uh, if you go an overview on uh, and make an overview of existing open source feature stores, they are kind of a similar, just with some minor details. There is a Python API for online inference, so you can feed your model with the fresh data from that. 
There are also offline mode if you want to do some sort of point in time join with the historical data. And there is also some catalog and versioning for the features and the ability to do time travel with the feature values. And the, the architecture of all these feature storages is still quite the, the same, but the main problem with this architecture of these three feature storages is that they are like half open source, half commercial. So it's just uh, in time, it becomes more and more complicated because they're drifting towards more and more uh, machine learning platform as a service that you just throw some bits of Python into some dashboard and it works for you until you pay the money and that can be also a problem because for us we don't want to have this giant diagram of things which are interacting with each other because we're just focused on the solving our pain our problem for the findify and don't want to pay that much money for just external solutions and so we wanted to have something simpler. So we'll just cover our narrow use cases. It won't have any extra dependencies. For extra dependencies, I don't that don't mean like a Python dependencies from PIP, but more like an infrastructural dependencies. So for example, if you go with Hopsworks and you try to self-host it, you might find that you need a Hadoop cluster for that. And on top of Hadoop cluster, there should be also NDB cluster, which is also like not an easy thing to be to, to, to operate. Uh, the installation of the things are usually quite automated with some help charts, but it works until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, probably you will have uh, a lot of headache understanding why your NDB cluster failed when you never worked with NDB cluster before. So that's the main problem. The same with Feast. So it's they're just going into another direction as a more managed solutions, but still if you have a lot of data and a lot of requests, your costs for Redshift and DynamoDB can also be quite significant. So, and we decided to just go to something simpler. And, uh, and we also observed while just working on the feature engineering in Findify that uh, most features we would do, we use for our models are kind of similar, they have the same high level types. Yeah, for sure, for price is a scholar feature, it's just a number or title, it's just a string, but it's not only about number and strings. So for example, we would like to count, like to count the number of clicks made by a customer, which is, it becomes a bit more complicated to, have to deal with it on the on the features because you need to like read and then write. It's like not, not atomic thing. You might have want to have not just a global counter, but like a window counter, number of clicks on a product per seven days. And this window moves. You, of course, can do it on the top of like existing feature stores when you just can write strings and numbers there. But you start like reinventing the wheel here. And, and there are some other types we also use, like frequency. It's just an estimation, but like, okay, this customer came from United States and it's 50% of, of the traffic for the store is from United States. So it's just a es frequency estimation for statistics. You got a price, it's an absolute value, 100 bucks. Is it a lot or not for this customer, for the store? But when you have like a median value, like median value may be estimation and the median is 200, you can understand that like 100 is actually quite cheap compared to other uh, products from the store and like bounded lists, like the last 10 colors interacted by with the customer and like last 10 viewed products, last 10 viewed categories, just last something. So it of course can be implemented on top of scalar values, but we rarely use just scalar values without any post aggregation like this. Uh, and it's usually for Feast and Hops work, it's not available and you still need to implement these things on the top by yourself. Uh, the main other main prob problem is multi-tenancy. So we're not a single store, it's like 1000 stores. You need to track all the machine learning features and all the histories per store. So it's like multi-tenancy and of course performance because like we have a lot of traffic but don't have a lot of money. So we need to be like lean in our solution so we cannot just buy one terabyte RAM instance on Amazon. 
Uh, and you still need to be uh, accurate while designing a feature store. There is a famous XKCD slide, picture about uh, standards, and I fixed it to for, for the feature storages. Okay, when you have 14 competing feature storages and you want to get a one universal one, and at the end there will be just 15 competing feature storages. So we don't want to go into this direction. So instead, we try to build like a feature store which covers just our needs. If it also covers like a specialized feature store, which is lean and simple. And if we're covering just our just our needs, we can of course make some sort of a tighter integration with the technology stack we're using. And we're using quite a lot of we're just avid users of Apache Flink with some even we are just sometimes just contributing some technical things or fixing some bugs we've spotted on the fling itself and we're highly like gvm based so it's scala but it's not really important that it's scala but it's more like it's not python and it's always implementing something from scratch and designing something from scratch is is fun so why not uh, so just a short intro to Apache Flink, and if you have ever seen Apache Spark, probably you did, or heard Apache Flink. It it's, looks the same from the first perspective, but the Flink is more like Apache Spark on steroids, focused on streaming and focused on stateful streaming. So that's the most important part, because if you try to do stateful streaming, streaming with Spark, you have like literally a map with state, and that's the all you have to do stateful streaming. How to do state persistence, backup, restores, and just uh, recover from the incidents. Like, no, you need to do it by yourself. With Flink, it's coming just out of the box. It's also about latency. So Spark, it's micro-batching. Flink is a true streaming. So records are just coming one by one. So you can go with like, 10 millisecond latency over the whole pipeline if you want. And it's not like sacrificing performance or something. It's just normal for Flink. And it's also quite a rich DSL for exactly the case of stateful streaming like we do, like we need. So if you want to do something on a Spark, like, OK, let's have a um, per product count of clicks uh, within the seven day rolling window and the window should be finalized every one hour. It seems to be complicated, but in Flink, it's just literally two lines of code. So it's just quite nice and I recommend everyone to do it. They also, a nice part of Flink is can also do batch processing. So the same code might work on bounded sources like S3 and unbounded sources like uh, Kafka. And it has some different runtime semantics, but in theory, uh, the same bounded and unbounded stream with the same data will result in the same output, which is also nice. And so you know, from the bird's eye of like bird's eye overview of how uh, Flink uh, is situated in our technology stack is just we have a like customers, uh, we have a stream of telemetry, there's magic happening here, and there comes features to our ranking engine. When you customer asks uh, us to search, we do like a, we select some candidates for a ranking like uh, th through Lucene or through Elasticsearch, we get some candidates, save them to send them to a ranking, and it also ranks top 100 into a personalized uh, ranking. And if you zoom in to do this Flink analytics uh, job and to see how it can be uh, viewed from the prism of feature store approach, is that okay? There is a customer. You send some telemetry about what customer is doing on the front end, like clicks, paid use, purchases, and here is like the boundary of our uh, feature storage approach. So uh, all the features itself, they just accept some uh, actions. So if you want to have count at the end, you need to send some increments there. If you want to have top N frequency, uh, you just string samples, send string samples there. The same for median, you just sample numbers. Here is just some sort of a basic thing that updates these features 
by the operations and periodically just emits them downstream into the ranking. So we can use it online for the inference part while doing it in real time. We also log all the feature updates into some persistent storage. Uh, for another viewpoint of that, what if what if we need to do to bootstrap a new machine learning feature? Like we decided to introduce yet another feature or train a model, and uh, we can go into a bit another direction, just glue the same things, but in another order. And instead of a customer, we have a traffic log the same thing that customer is generated, but it's just written into a file. So we fed the same system from a file with a traffic log. Again, generate this increments, whatever operations we want to apply, and also just write this new feature into this persistent storage. And being honest, the persistent storage is just a set of files on S3. So we just write them as is. And, uh, Okay, and for offline training, it's again the same thing, but just glued in another direction. So you got your traffic log, you join them into like a click through, and each click through, like the search, clicks, and purchases, are uh, piped through this point in time join approach, as I described a bit earlier, with this change log from this feature storage. And that's all. So there, here comes your training data set. You just dump it into XGBoost, TensorFlow, whatever you want, and call it a day. So, uh, so here comes the actual dualism of online and offline processing for the feature storages. So there are real people or maybe traffic log, but it's still the same events uh, coming transformed into some actions which are applied, applied into some features. And their state is emitted into persistent storage and either to model training or for online ML inference. And you might wonder where is like the actual place of the feature store in this diagram? Because there is no actual service, there is no actual SaaS or whatever that you can install in your Kubernetes cluster. And uh, just my personal opinion is that feature store approach is more like a glorified feature machine learning feature value change log. So you just, uh, and you can have two ways of interacting with the change log, either serve the last value or just do point in time join with the historical data. And that's literally all. So our feature store is actually not really a product or like a service or a SaaS that you can pay money to use. It's more like a minimal low code feature store uh, where it eats protobufs, just a structure like, okay, there is this an increment. There is a field like key and the field is for value, like how much you should increment. It's like a numerical sample, string sample, appending to a list or so on. And it also emits protobufs at the end. So you send an increment, it chewed it, made some magic and emitted like a daily counts or emitted just a global count or whatever. And uh, there is some like feature update logic happening in, in, in between and some code to do point in time join with this feature change logs. So that's actually it. And uh, it's available on GitHub. So if you want to play with it, there are even some docs and it's published on Maven Central. So technically you can use it. Uh, the current uh, state of it, uh, so it's open source. So you can try to play with it. I will just make some kind of a demo a bit later how it looks like how it feels like to work with this feature store and why it's like a low code approach to feature stores so it's just a set of uh protobuf in protobuf out flink functions so you're like free to interact with it from any language you want and to leverage any connectors flink has so if you want to read from kafka or from pulsar or from kinesis it doesn't really care because like it ha it's handled not by the, the, the tool itself, but by the underlying framework because Flink can talk to anything, like dumping it to Elasticsearch, whatever. It's just supported by the framework. And some also 
S3 and the HDFS I/O to be able to read and write features from some some storage, but it's still not limited to S3 and HDFS. At least if you have a connector for that for Flink, uh, it's actually in production at Findify for you know a week. <laughs> uh, so it can be considered like an alpha status, but it still somehow works. I can't even show you how it looks like. Wait a bit, wait a bit, wait a bit. I have like a Flink dashboard. Yeah, you know, like three days of uptime uh, seems to be like gigantic, but it's, it still like takes some uh, business events from Kinesis stream, uh, transform them to this operations. Uh, we process and emit this feature shape, like snapshots feature values to Redis for the inference. That's the whole literally feature store, which is like, seems to be quite simple. Uh, and okay, so just a short demo. Uh, so the, the feature, uh, as it's on a GitHub, there is an examples sub project there with just a single file example. I have it open in my EDS, so I will just go over it. Sorry for Scala, it's like, but I still use it a lot for prototyping because it's just fast and uh, can help me develop faster. Uh, so Python people won't believe that it can be done. Like, no way. You no, I don't to... believe you. <laughs> yeah, but still, even for the small systems, no, but for large systems, yeah, like refactoring is a, when it compiles, it works. Can you do it with a Python? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the point. Okay. Uh, so we have a couple of our domain events, like, okay, the product metadata with some ID, title, inventory count, and the timestamp when this metadata event happened. We get like an impression when we showed some products to the user at some moment. And we have like an interaction event, like I product ID user, so user clicked on that product. And we define also a couple of just feature types we would like to track with this feature. So like product title and number of uh, inventory count are just scholar values. No, nothing fancy. And for we also want a merchant-wide numerical estimator for the inventory sizes. So we need to track like 30, 50, 70, and 90% quantiles for the for inventory counts. The same we would like to have number of clicks for the product. Uh, in the one hour buckets and we want to aggregate them into like one hour, 12 hour, 24 hour uh, windows. The same with product impressions, but not just clicks, but the impressions with the same uh, like ranges. And we can also have some lab, like user scope, user grouped, uh, like number of clicks made by the user. And, uh, and that's all. So here we have our demo click stream. So we got like an impression from the user zero, just to have some statistics and a click on product two. And then we came, uh, then the, the, the came like a three metadata events. So we like record that, okay, we know that there are three products with these titles, with this inventory counts. And then we have an impression that for user one, for us, we showed product one to three and we clicked on the product too, and then came yet another metadata event and the inventory updated. And when we clicked on this product three after that. So that's it. We teach Flink how to extract timestamp from our domain events. And then we just transform our events in like the metadata impression and click into the actual operations on our feature store. So, okay, it's, if it's a product title, we just take the title and make a put, like write a scholar value. The same for count. Okay, we want to have a, a number of uh, clicks for the, ah, it's just the numerical statistics. So it's uh, this feature about tracking the, quantiles for inventory sizes. So we 
emit the inventory size for this uh, product, if we got an impression, we increment uh, this feature in for the impressions and the same for product clicks and for user clicks. So it's just a boundary between our domain model and the actual API of the feature store because it only works on this operations. And then we can run it and see there is a, like a feature process, the function which does all the magic. It's not that not not that complicated, by the way. So it's like like this. Okay. So what it is here, and here comes the change log, like the feature change log, which was like computed after processing all the domain events and after updating all our features. It's like quite large, but you can see that when the metadata events came, we got our quantiles being recomputed while the, the metadata events arrived, which is nice. But we can go further and see uh, and get our clicks to click through. So, okay, the user one, while showing, seeing this products clicked on a product two and product three. And we also like extract the time here and do a join, like point in time join, which is just like a single function here. And wait a bit, wait a bit. So we do point in time join with our click through and all the feature change logs. What's going on? It's running and yeah, it's there. And then like joint values, here comes our click stream, click through, but there are also uh, the feature values joined like back in time. So the, after this point in time join, when this actual click stream click through happened. So looks looks okay. So there are just titles for each products, the inventory size and so on and so forth. It seems to be like working. So that's the whole API, literally just two functions, which seems to be quite nice. Uh, okay, so back to the slides. Uh, what about the, some future plans? So as uh, the whole low code feature store is literally just two functions, uh, we might <laughs> uh, want to do some like better is included approach. So connectors for Redis, there are actually connector for Redis and Cassandra, but there are some issues with the a throughput, so we would like to work on, and also connector for Postgres to store like real time, like latest versions of your features. It can also work with Python, but we never actually tried. But it's still just prot above in, prot above out, so it should be quite simple. And uh, just more docs and examples how it should work. But uh, the uh, idea behind this building this feature store is not only about just some narrow idea of some nerds like me about managing machine learning features but we're also trying to build some sort of a, a product on top of that like still an open source product but uh, focused mostly on ranking so for example, it's like a Lucene and Elasticsearch dichotomy. Lucene is a library and it was present for 20 years, but still it was quite complicated to use and you need to write a lot of code to make it work for your search. And then Elasticsearch came and you just throw JSONs there and it just works. You don't need to write any code. So like, uh, but it's still solving quite a lot of typical problems for search. Not all of the problems which are solvable by Lucy, but just like top 50, top 80%. Uh, it's focused on a learn to rank. It's some like a personalization engine to re rank your search results, your widgets on a page, your suggestions, your recommendations, but just taking into account the feedback, like telemetry coming from a customer. It's still based on the feature framework because it's just a thin uh, glue on top of the feature store itself and still with the Apache flink. So from the from the product perspective, it just accepts a stream of clicks, impressions, and the metadata. And you can train your model on this uh, historical traffic recording or just serve the model doing intra-session ranking. So it's not like going to 
cover 100% of all the cases people want to do with uh, learn to rank systems. But still, it's like a Pareto principle. With 20% of efforts, you can do 80% of the profits. So that's what we're targeting into. And I've heard, I've seen a lot of times that people are just implementing the same way to compute CTR per product, like compute conversion per product, conversion per search, and to, like parse user agents and refers and so on, and just like uh, expand and hot code tags and categories. But still, it's usually the same for most of the cases, most of the, most of the uh, online, I mean, like personalization in real time, in personalization in the internet. So just a set of features you can compute on a set of uh, feedback events and just call it a day without writing any code. Uh, and it's still, the, the, the overall structure is just the most low level heavy lifting uh, is made by Apache Flink. So we're just implementing some APIs to do some custom joins and feature processing with the feature storage. And MetaRank is just an interface, how you should define an impression, like what fields are there, how click looks like, and how model should be trained. So that's literally all. Uh, the current status of MetaRank is, uh, this should be like a nice gift to illustrate how, how good it is. So, so it's not yet feature complete. We're aggressively working on that. And it's some sort of like a pre-alpha stage, but mostly we're mostly focused on just design of the system and see, trying to understand what is the use case uh, and how it should look like from the engineer perspective. Uh, but still, we did quite a lot of back-end work for that. Uh, so that's literally, literally the whole story. Uh, that's my LinkedIn profile. If you want to talk about feature storages or ranking or whatever, I'm always open to new contacts and to discuss some weird things. Uh, the feature framework is on GitHub and on Maven Central. MetaRank is also on GitHub, but not on Maven Central because you know there is nothing to put there. I mean that there is code, it can even run, but it's still not too too early to be run even on, on a staging. So, and uh, there was a secret on the QR code you need to check after that. Uh, okay, so that's all. If anyone have any questions, you're welcome. Can you go back to the QR code? Aha, uh -huh. so people can scan. Oh, uh, you won't believe I'm putting this QR code for multiple of my online talks and no one actually uh, complained about what's there because people probably thought that it's a link to my LinkedIn, but it's not. Okay, is it this... Uh... Okay, I will not spoil. <laughs> <laughs> I suspected that. I mean, I literally yeah. thought it would be that. I don't yeah. know why, because I think I, today I got, um, I clicked on the list link and this is what happened to me. So yeah. <laughs> I think I picked the curiosity for many people now. Yeah. So, so oh. yeah, we have quite a lot of questions, actually. 12 questions. Um, I don't know. Should I maybe share my screen so you can also read uh, the questions? Okay, let's do it. I think this way will be a little bit simpler for you. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Should a feature store store only aggregated join data or should store raw data and aggregations and join uh, joins happen on the fly? We actually store both, just in case. <laughs> yeah, uh, because you know, you might find a glitch in your aggregation code and you're doomed, so you need to recompute the segregations. But practically, we never experienced this for the one week of production running of the system. <laughs> uh, Ambush, actually, I think he, uh, he checked the QR code, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. OK, should we go with the next one? Yeah, should a feature store combine a processing layer, hopes for a run, or be just a store features? 
you know it just subjective it depends on the way you work with the with features in your company so uh we prefer not to complicate uh the whole um way of working uh with this feature storages. So if it can be done easy and it will just a dump of files on S3, then fine. Because it's actually just we're a, a small company and uh, we don't have like a large team of MLOps engineers doing this type of job. So it's usually I who manage feature store and I just don't want to spend much time managing it. And I don't want to deploy a Hadoop cluster with a DB cluster on top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, there was also a question about this ML run somewhere. Ah, this one, right? So, uh, actually, yeah, have you checked actually, them? No, I need to see what's that. Uh, just uh, that interesting idea, what well, interesting observations that uh, like two years ago there were almost no feature stores, and now it's like uh, one feature store a month ML run. Yeah, MLOps, MLOps. I think I saw this logo somewhere. They did a hackathon recently, I think. Yeah. If you're interested in feature stores, there will be a, a feature store summit conference, even maybe next week. I need to be sure, but you need to Google for that. And there will be a lot of talks from people from different large companies. It's so uh, organized by Hops Works. Uh, but surprisingly, there are not so many Hopes Works uh, sponsored talks there. So they're mostly from people from industry like Uber and the Airbnb about how they do it. Mm -hmm. And they usually have some sort of a, their own feature store. But still, it's just not the product. It's more about the approach. So we also did the feature store with two functions on Flink. And it still somehow works fine for us. Do, do you know why this excitement all of a sudden with feature stores? I think last year it was, uh, we can call it a year of feature stores because all of a sudden they just popped up like mushrooms after rain. I, I, I think it's just the industry converged to it, maturity. So when you have uh, multiple data scientists, uh, multiple data science teams with some shared data source and some shared uh, machine learning features, it would be nice to have some sort of catalog or some sort of shared pipelines to update them. So, but more, mostly maturity. Five years ago, it was too early. Mm -hmm. Now seems to be its time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think we covered that more or less, right? Uh, yeah. But actually, I never tried ML mm -hmm. something. ML run. ML run. So this one, why are you using Flink, not Spark? I think you mentioned, I remember this slide with uh, like, uh, you know, big doc. Uh... And small doc, yeah, because of this. So we store quite a lot of state while computing all these features. So uh, for example, if you go with the periodic counters, you we are not saving this. So we have some FML data, like the per day counters, and then once in an hour, we aggregate them into some windows. So you need to store the state somewhere. And if you go with stateful streaming with Spark, it's like a common wisdom that you should like use some external database for that. And then it will just become very complicated. So you're literally implementing Apache Flink on the top of Apache Spark, which is doable, but like, why should you reinvent the existing thing? And migrating from Spark to Flink is like is a breeze because they are like extremely similar. So probably like Spark is a uh, subset of Flink. So you can probably migrate your Spark job to Flink. I don't know in in a couple of hours because it's just it's the same DSL. But of course you can do much more with just a Flink if you thought we were talking about stateful processing yeah okay so and um, your design would change because you would need to implement anything on top of that yeah right? yeah we consider it using spark and implementing it with spark and uh, actually if you go into the 
deep of the feature on the GitHub, you might notice that there are actually two implements. So the, the features are actually somewhere here. Right? Okay. No, no, not, not that deep. I mean that in the code <laughs> itself and not in the Git log. Uh, <laughs> So that there are two actual implementations of this feature store, like the Flink one and in memory one. And so it, it, it's okay to have multiple implementations of the same idea. The memory one is just like a reference one. So we run the same uh, test data on memory one and on Flink one and assume that the results should match like the way to to do some sort of sanity check. In future, oh, CI failing. Yeah, that's fail. That yes. happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time with the projects which are like one week in production. Oh, actually the feature store itself is a bit more older, maybe half a year or something, but uh, still in quite an early ages. Yeah. You'll have some work to do tomorrow. Uh, as, as usual, as usual. <laughs> Okay, should we go to the next one? Yes. Yeah. So does the change log track changes at a role level for a data set? If yes, what is your opinion in using the feature drift which tracks at the data set level? Uh, but when you have like a feature log on a role level like you described, so for each product, we got all the feature of the like uh, price updates for for the last year. And then it's quite an easy job to do a feature drift detection. You, of course, can stream your feature updates into the time series database, or you can have like a Spark job, which reads this change logs and dumps them into like Facebook's profit to have some forecasting and outlier detection. But it's still like up to you. We never actually tried to solve already solved problem. problem. So basically what you're saying is there are existing solutions that solve, that uh, yeah. detect feature drift and you can just plug them uh, on top of... Uh, yeah, yeah. For, for for the like feature value updates are just protobufs. Okay, if it's a scalar value, it will be just key and value and timestamp. So you just dump it into profit and call it a day. Okay, so I think... In talked a bit about scale, but uh, maybe you can reiterate on some numbers. Uh, so, uh -huh. so for the trip, so for historical data, it's maybe 50 terabytes of data we use for training. So it's like an input data, this traffic log. For the Flink cluster size, uh, for this job is more like 20 task managers. So it's not giant. And it's not our first attempt doing something like this with feature stores. Actually, there was another internal one before. And feature is more like a, an attempt to fix all the problems of our previous internal one. And for example, with this 220 task managers, uh, we can crunch the whole history like for half a year of traffic in like one or two hours because we spend some time how the work is parallelized over the Flink cluster. So for example, when uh, you update a feature, we actually partition by the feature itself. So there are no hotspots on the cluster and you all the 20 task managers actually have approximately the same amount of load because you partition by the feature itself. I mean that by the feature itself, like a, it's a combination of a tenant and the feature. So then even if you have uneven distribution of tenants, like a merchant doing uh, 5 million searches a day and the merchant having five searches a day, they want to block your task manager because it's like this giant merchant will be just distributed evenly across the whole cluster. But it's not that big deal with Flink, just K by, by something and call it a day. For scaling strategies, we just don't, <laughs> like it's a constant, constantly provisioned amount of task managers and that's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, when you have peaks in traffic, uh, it puts for this, for uh, for training, it's twenty task managers. For online inference, it's just four right now. 
because like it works, mm -hmm. even considering the amount of traffic. You have quite a few stores, right? You have a lot of stores. About right? 1,000, yeah. And then each of them generates a lot of searches per day. Yes, but still we got some like protobo. So it, it, the, when I describe a traffic log, it doesn't mean that it's just a full JSON request going there. So it's more like a already processed and structured event. So it's technically mm -hmm. just a prot above describing who clicked, where clicked, and so on and so forth. But still, uh, we're constantly hitting our Kinesis throughput limitations. So that's a lot of data. OK. Yeah. So for, how did you set up backfilling for new features on the training side? Uh, yeah, in Apache Flink, you can, you're quite free in the way you store data. So we just bucket by feature name. So then you, when you do backfill, it's just a set of files in S3 with some shared prefix. So that's all. You just backfill and copy it somewhere for the model training. So in terms of implement, implementing, you just, uh, when you start your job, you say, okay, take data from this location, right? And so, so all the features, so the, like, the feature change log is uh, like updated in real time, but this like online inference job, which is just logging the current feature values. But you can also run a historical job on the traffic, uh, on the traffic recording on a traffic log and compute a separate, set of uh, feature change logs uh, for specific features and just dump it into S3 and then with another job, just load everything with a new feature, train your new model and call it a day. With Flink, it's also possible to switch this internal state from the offline job to online job. So you bootstrap on a historical data and then switch your source from S3 to Kafka like in real time and it just works mm -hmm. so it starts when it starts it reads from s3 and then there is a switch it says yeah. okay from this point i am reading not from s3 but uh, yeah some yeah yeah stream. and it's surprisingly it's just an out of the box solution so we don't write it down we're just using existing frameworks for that okay so another question from ankush is are you modifying protobuf to parquet for offline training? No, because for offline training, you still have some raw access, like per product. So you don't well, need columnar co right? co column storage is more about analytics. Like, OK, what is an average price across the whole stores? What is the number of clicks in, in May? Uh, we do have something like this, but it's just more into the reports, more about reports and not about the training. Mm -hmm. So basically, you have the same data stored in different formats for different purposes. Yeah. Okay. So another question. So how will you modify this for returning customers? Something like Amazon. Uh, it just goes about just more about feature engineering. So it's not limiting you in the way you define your features. You can, of course make something like, a, okay, has this customer bought something from this category or or whatever, just is it like his favorite color based on his returning customer activity? We just not really focusing on that because we don't have such customers in general for in, in the majority of the cases, but it's more about the way you define features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So I think we should be wrapping up. Maybe we yeah. can take... Uh... And the last, last one about UI. Yes. Yeah, I think it's important, but it's more like we're just exposing these drifts as a Prometheus matrix and graphing them in Grafana. So that's like a low-code, do-it-yourself approach. Yeah, for sure. We can have a team of UI engineers doing dashboards and some React, but we just don't. Mm -hmm. Because you can do it with existing tools. Like, like the whole approach of this feature project is just to glue existing things together that you can like build your own feature storage like in, in a week. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, that, that's cool. So how about taking these questions offline, the rest of the questions and answering them in Slack? What do you think? Uh, or we yeah. can cover them quickly. Yeah, Cassandra for feature store doesn't support joins, but we're not doing joins in Cassandra, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing joins not in Cassandra, but in inside of the Flink job itself while doing this whole uh, click stream processing while joining the change log of the features. So Cassandra is just a glorified key value store for the real time feature feeding into your machine learning model. So Cassandra, Redis, Memcached, whatever you want. Yeah. So, and the song, the song, like it's a recrawl famous. Yeah. This is like a, a prank that is quite old, right? Yeah. Yeah. But still there are people never actually uh, observed this prank in real time. <laughs> Okay. Probably so, we we reduced the amount. Yes, by one at least. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for telling us about uh, feature stores and this feature store. And thanks everyone for joining us today also and asking questions, especially Ankush and Vincode. You I think posted a lot of questions, like 10 at least. Uh, so thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's it. Um, do you have any, do you want to say anything before we finish? Mm, I say it quite a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're tired of talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So thank you yeah. for your time. It was a pleasure talking and the pleasure answering to all the questions because it's like a lot of them. But yeah. It means that it was interesting, at least for someone. <laughs> yeah. So have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. See you.